Thank you, and welcome everybody to our noon webinar today. My name is John Brodigan with the League of Women Voters and Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. And our topic today is a conversation on healthcare and democracy. It has been said that um, healthcare reform is the unfinished business of the civil rights movement. And I might add that campaign finance reform is the unfinished business of the voting rights movement, although uh, both movements do have indeed a bunch of other unfinished business to be attended to. But today we're gonna to focus on the, these two questions that don't often come up together, um, healthcare and democracy. And these are, I would have to say, two of the most vexing public policy issues in our time. They have resisted easy solutions. They have resisted really any solutions. And there's a great deal um, of thought that has gone into a variety of different approaches on both. And we've seen incremental measures on both move forward, um, but there still um, are problems to be solved here. Um, but notwithstanding uh, having not one, but two difficult issues, you know, the League of Women Voters um, always welcomes a challenge. So we're gonna bring them both to you today. And we have a terrific panel who's gonna sort it all out. Um, so without further uh, ado, I'm delighted and grateful really to welcome our three panelists and I'll shortly turn it over to them. Um, we will have uh, presentations from each of the three of them. There will be um, some discussion and then following that, there will be some opportunities for questions from um, our audience, our listeners today. So let me begin with um, Kate Sykes. Um, Kate is an investigative journalist with a background in healthcare administration. She's a volunteer organizer with the Maine Democratic Socialists of America and an advocate of Medicare for All. And I should just personally add that I've um, seen Kate in action and I've been in many meetings with her and I really am grateful for her insightful thinking and her um, courageous and bold advocacy. Let me also introduce Dr. Jeffrey Gratwick. Um, Dr. Gratwick was a rheumatologist and immunologist, immunologist in Bangor for 40 years and is now recently retired. He served in the Maine State Senate for eight years where he was chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. And I also had the pleasure of appearing in his committee several times on a handful of healthcare related bills and um, got to see his leadership in action there. Finally, um, Dr. Phil Caper has received his, his BA, MS, and MD degrees at UCLA, where he was trained in internal medicine um, at the Harvard Medical Unit at Boston City Hospital. He has held professorships at Dartmouth Medical School, the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he was also vice chancellor for health affairs, chief of the medical staff, and hospital director. He's been an adjunct lecturer on health policy management at the Harvard School of Public Health a research associate at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and Associate in Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and has written and published um, eloquently on related uh, topics. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll begin with Kate Sykes and I will turn, I will turn it over to her and I believe um, that uh, Dr. Gratwick does have a slide deck, but I think Kate is just going to be speaking with us for uh, a few minutes to get things started. So thank you, Kate. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Um, so uh, to leave enough time for questions at the end, I'm gonna kind of rapidly go through this information. Um, but first, I just wanna say that um, I, I, for full disclosure, I am a democratic socialist. That fundamentally means that I want our economy to be controlled by the people um, and for finite, finite resources to be distributed equitably and to the greatest number of individuals possible. That's how I defined my, um, my connection to socialism. Um, and I think that's a great place to start with a conversation around Medicare for all. Um, so I worked in the healthcare system for about 15 years. I'm married to a physician um, and uh, that experience of seeing how um, income inequality in, uh, in basically impacts um, population health uh, led me to the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 the fight for Medicare for all and ultimately to DSA where a lot of that work is happening. Um, so Medicare for all, um, as we know, is a universal healthcare program. Um, it would be free at the point of service and it would pay, be paid for through um, taxes. And that would be 
taxes that are progressive. So we're, it's basically a um, pay what you can kind of situation. Um, so that program um, has incredibly broad support in the United States, about 70% of people um, support Medicare for all and uh, particularly broad support among working class people, regardless of political affiliation. Um, despite that, we have been unable to win Medicare for all. Um, in terms of health outcomes, reproductive freedoms, financial liberation, uh, universal health care would disproportionately benefit women. Um, so that's something that is important to understand about Medicare for all, especially for this audience, the League of Women Voters. Um, and the other thing that I, that this data that I've been able to kind of dig up um, it shows us is that the status quo, which is basically healthcare for private profit, is held in place by an elaborate web of um, really delicately balanced financial structures and cultural myths um, that are unlikely to change unless we organize and um, and agitate against that and for universal health care. So those are the three three take homes, I think, from the data that I've been able to, um, to dig up here. So as an investigative journalist, this is, I, I enjoyed like poking into um, kind of dark corners of, uh, of um, databases and, and seeing what the data holds. So um, let's jump right into that. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can look at some of the graphs here. Sorry for the delay. Okay. So um, what I particularly looked at was the 2020 US Senate race in Maine. Um, it is really a microcosm of what we're seeing in terms of healthcare finance, healthcare um, contributions to political campaigns broadly, um, but it's a really good, uh, you know, national election got a lot of attention and, it's, and it really is, it, absolutely, if you just expand this, this is what um, contrib healthcare uh, contributions to um, political campaigns look like nationally. So. Uh, the totals for contributions to the uh, U.S. Senate race, that was the Collins, Gideon, and a couple of independents, um, were pretty pretty well split. So this is looking just at healthcare contributions. So you can see the 52% or 53% of um, uh, contributions from the healthcare uh, industry went to Republicans, and about 46% went to Democrats, and a very thin slice, it was like $300 total, <laughs> went to um, third-party candidates. Um, so the thing we have to think about with um, healthcare contributions is that some come from individuals that are affiliated with the healthcare industry and some come from organizations that are um, non-individuals, let's call them. Some of those non-individuals are corporate, some of them are nonprofits, some of them are associations. Um, and it, it looks very different, different depending on if you're looking at individual contrib financial contributions or um, non-individual. So this is the graph for non-individual. And as you can see, um, it very heavily skews um, Republican. So most of the non-individual contributions from healthcare entities in the US Senate race came, went to um, Republicans. And so you can see that insurance companies um, were skewed that way. Health professionals is a big outlier. So just a, a bunch of um, uh, non-individual contributions came from the healthcare sector, went to Republicans. And then we have healthcare services. So this would be things like um, ambulance driver or ambulance corporations, um, you know, other ancillary health services, hospitals and nursing homes, pretty self-explanatory. And then this is the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceutical product industry. Um, I wanna to return to health professionals because what this actually is, this is very interesting. Um, it is uh, associations, so doctor and nurse, nurse associations. Um, so these would be advocacy groups that advocate for uh, healthcare professionals such as doctors and nurses and all of your academies of, so this would be the Academy of um, uh, family physicians, the Academy of uh, Dermatologists, and, uh, you know, the American Academy of uh, uh, Emergency Room Physicians. So all of these, these organizations are donating pre predominantly to, um, the, to the Republican in the race. So let's move forward to um, individual healthcare contributions. So these contributions would be coming from actual people, right? So actual people who have some affiliation with an insurance company um, 
healthcare professionals. So these are actual doctors and nurses and other allied health professionals that are contributing individually to a political race. Um, people that work for healthcare services are affiliated in that with that industry in some way. Hospital and nursing home workers, pharmaceutical workers, people who work for Johnson & Johnson. So as you can see, it's very different when we look at individual contributions to these races. They skew very heavily, heavily to the Democratic um, Party candidate. So I think that tells us a, a, some very interesting stuff around um, you know, the idea of voice, right? So speech um, is elevated uh, by money. And so, um, so we, we, we know that like free speech isn't really free, right? That like free speech has to do with money. Um, and that when individual people speak, they're speaking um, for certain political things. And when uh, aggregate corporations and other associations speak, they're speaking in the opposite direction. I think this is particularly telling because what I'm seeing from this graph is that um, doctors and nurses uh, their voting preferences are not represented by the organizations that they belong to, the institutions that supposedly represent them. Um, they skew the exact opposite. So I find that to be a really interesting graph. Um, so one of the things that um, I think we should, that we should take home from this uh, is that um, so donations from non-individual healthcare sector donors are weighted towards Republicans with the exception of Planned Parenthood. So that is, that is the one institution that is skewing Democrat. Um, and then donations from the individual uh, healthcare sector weight towards Democrats without exception. Um, professional academies and associations are not reflecting the donation and voting preferences of their mem members. And let's return to Planned Parenthood for a moment because Planned Parenthood is making up a lot of ground for Democrats on issues of women's reproductive health care. But because they're not actually advocating for universal health care, we're not, they're not getting us any closer to a Medicare for all um, vision. So um, this cultural issue, so excuse me for a moment. So this cultural issue is, um, is something that is sort of uh, creating a, a, a fulcrum, balancing the fulcrum um, between the two parties, but um, it's not in line with what voters really want, which 70% um, of voters want Medicare for all. Um, it's also interesting to think about the fact that if we did have Medicare for all, we would have, um, uh, you know, a basically a, a liber liberating experience for women whose um, jobs would be uncoupled from their health care, um, who would uh, experience better health care throughout our lifetime. So I've gone on for long enough. I'm going to leave it there and we'll answer questions at the last. Uh, that's terrific, Kate. And you, you, you've um, provided some unique um, research here that I think I have personally not seen before. And there'll be a, a subject for some discussion later on. And we'll have a chance to follow up with you on some of your thoughts. Uh, let's turn next to uh, Dr. Jeff Gratwick and former Senator Jeff Gratwick, and I believe he does have also a presentation, so if we can, uh, there we go, thank you. Thanks very much. Well, first of all, I found that Kate's um, introduction was fascinating and totally outrageous, because I have to say that I'm a member of the Maine Medical Association, and I've got to find out whether they're really representing me and us. Um, because that data is really quite striking. But at any rate, I too have put out some slides here because it always seems to me that two ways of appreciating uh, ideas are better than one, which is to say talking and then um, the visual here. So background, I think we all know that our healthcare system is broken, it's too complex, too expensive, too wasteful. 25% of what we spend on healthcare is wasted. And the profit motive that Kate has talked about um, there is, is very pervasive and uh, invidious. The solution is going to be some variety of universal health care. And to this end, um, a group that I'm affiliated with and that Dr. Caper is affiliated with, uh, Maine Healthcare, and then a C4, the action group, is presenting a res resolve to the Maine voters um, gathering signatures. Next slide, please. Next, gathering signatures from now until um, next um, January. And then this will come before the voters in uh, the next election, 11 slash 22. Uh, Jen, can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, great. Um, the universal 
the healthcare resolve we're working on is very narrowly focused and it quote directs the legislature's health and human health care financial services and insurance committee uh, to develop legislation establishing a system of universal health care and directs the committee to report out a bill to the full legislature by um, 11 by 2024. There are some specifics here designed to be very general um, because there have been a number of bills here, both in um, Maine and elsewhere throughout the nation that are very complex. Uh, I personally had an 80 page bill uh, that I thought was near perfect, uh, but then it was um, picked apart page 39, paragraph three and page 64, paragraph X, it picked apart and things don't do well that way. And so the legislature, if it goes back to a mandate to the legislature, this is what the people of Maine want, the legislature will have to act. Next slide, please, Jen. So this, this is uh, just some information, but mainhealthcare.org or mainallcare.org are places you can get further information. Next slide, please. So some of the questions that have been raised about this, um, does the resolve have the teeth, the oomph needed to bring about meaningful change? And specifically, as I just said, this is not designed to have a particular plan because they get shot down too easily. It's designed to ensure the main people have a strong voice in determining what happens in the healthcare system. I think we all agree it's too expensive and this is what we can do about it. Well, but then your logical question, what about all the details? The co-pays, people argue about this all day long. Co-pays, deductibles, organization, rural care, provider groups, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, many issues there. And the resolve is purposefully um, skirting those issues and it doesn't deal with them. Beginning in January 23, once this resolve has passage, the specific details will be hammered out by the legislature in open forum with widespread public input. And this is just the opposite of what happens now. The decisions are made in corporate boardrooms. And next slide, please, John. Is it Maine too small a state to affect major change? Um, the answer is no. Um, there's a, a very good, pretty liberal group, the Maine Center for Economic Policy, uh, concluded that Maine could cover every resident with publicly funded health care and save $1.5 billion. And it's worth while noting that the Canadian system, which the Canadians, by the way, like immeasurably more than we like our system, the Canadian system started in Saskatchewan, which is a, a province in um, central western Canada, similar population, 1.3 million, poverty, um, economics, uh, and rural of uh, Maine. And that's where um, the Canadian healthcare the reform started and it spread to the rest of Canada under the leadership, that dynamic, exciting leadership of someone called Tommy Douglas. Number four, isn't change at the federal level needed for a true fix? The answer is yes, absolutely. I'm, I feel strongly, I agree with Kate that we need to have Medicare for all. There's a number of different bills relating to this, but it's not gonna happen right away. Biden has been very cautious. What about healthcare inequalities? Long-standing inequities can only be addressed if we shift resources from bureaucracy, profits, and excessive salaries to public health and caregiving. And as I said before, remember that 25% of our um, healthcare dollars are, are basically wasted. Um, I live in Bangor, and over in Brewer is a fancy um, billing office, 312 employees, and this similar, um, Billing office in Ottawa for the similar number of people is three. Um, those people can be retrained to do something else. Next, um, please. Uh, finally, why would Mainers who like their current insurance plans be willing to give them up for a statewide plan? There's uh, e very good evidence that once up and running, a nonprofit publicly run healthcare plan will deliver a better plan for than virtually any for-profit plan at a lower cost, a lower cost. Some wealthy Mainers, to be sure, are going to pay higher taxes, but they, and indeed all Mainers, will enjoy having more money left in their pocket 
Uh, this is one of the problems in Vermont. The point was not made in well enough that you may pay more in taxes through the government, um, but you, you're going to be better off. Um, you're going to be saving that $1.5 billion. And finally, what about main care, main businesses and workers? Lower health care costs will be a boom for main businesses. As I'm sure people are aware, it's an enormous drag on businesses to have to deal with all these issues of health care um, and changes. Workers will be able to bargain for better wages and working conditions. They won't have to spend their time bargaining about health care. That I'm happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Appreciate that. And um, really interesting to see your insight into this resolve that's moving forward. We're going to hear a lot more about this year. Um, okay, next I'm going to turn it over to uh, Philip Caper, Dr. Caper. Hey, thanks, John. Um, Jeff and Kate have done a very nice job of covering the waterfront here, <clears throat> but I'd like to take a little different approach. The United States is the only country in the wealthy world that uh, has a lot that has for-profit publicly traded companies as part of the mainstay of their healthcare systems. And that makes the United States exceptional. And I believe that is the differentiating, if you will, thinking as a physician, you know, the underlying pathology of the American healthcare system is the use of publicly traded companies uh, in a very key role. That includes insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, and hospital and other provider uh, companies. And I've watched this transition from a largely not-for-profit, not not-for-profit system focused on disease, preventing disease, diagnosing it, treating it, curing it, and helping to heal. That was the focus of the healthcare system of 50 years ago when I became a physician. And that has, over that period of time, been transformed into a system where the major focus is on the bottom line. And I believe one reason for that is that the mission of any investor-owned company is to create wealth for its owners, no matter what it does. And if it doesn't do that, they go out of business. So their mission is to create wealth for the owners, and that includes healthcare companies. The mission of the healthcare system is different. It's to focus on the patient and what's best for the patient. And I think it's that clash of missions that uh, accounts for many of the signs and symptoms of dysfunction we see in the American healthcare systems, such as out of control costs, uh, persistent 10% or more level of uninsurance, another 10 or 20% of underinsurance, and a level of interference in clinical decision making by the healers, by the doctors and the nurses, that is unheard of and would be not would not be tolerated in almost any other country. Let me give you an example of that. Our healthcare system and the way it's configured doesn't make a lot of sense to people if you think of it as a healthcare system. But if you think of it as a wealth transfer system from the people who buy health services and products to the people who sell them, it makes a lot of sense. And it's actually doing a very good job of that. In fact, too good a job, which accounts to a great degree in our, uh, for our very high prices. But it also accounts for the fact that we have a surplus of profitable services and a shortage of unprofitable services, such as primary care, such as mental health services, such as primary prevention. Primary prevention, that is preventing illness from occurring in the first place, is a bad business strategy because you're killing the customer in a way. And that's something that uh, most people don't really understand. 
On the other hand, we build these shrines to services that do make a lot of money, invasive cardiology, radiology, orthopedics, and so on. And a, start, a striking example of that was what happened at Maine General Hospital a couple of years ago. Maine General is a large hospital in Augusta. It serves a large area and has a beautiful new building. But for some reason, a couple of years ago, they decided, and by the way, their nonprofit status is because they're supposed to be providing a public good. But for some reason, they decided to shut down their diabetes service. And it's not because there's no shortage of di new diabetics in this state. There are plenty of them. Diabetes is related to poverty, to a bad diet, to lack of exercise, and uh, it needs to be treated in a very labor intensive way. So you need very skilled people managing that disease and they're expensive. So the reason the hospital gave for shutting down their diabetes service in, in the face of what's actually a, a, a epidemic of diabetes was that it was not profitable. It was a line of business that was unprofitable. So any good businessman faced with a line of business that couldn't turn a profit eliminates that line of business. And that was the kind of thinking that went into that. And so they cut loose about 4,000 diabetics. And at the time, there was only one practice, diabetes practice in Maine, taking new, new patients. And it was in Southern Maine. And that's the kind of distortion in clinical decision-making and in the configuration of services that is responding to the profit motive. And it makes perfect sense to the people who are, who are now running the hospitals because the corporate culture has invaded our nonprofit sector as well. And another sign of that is that, you know, remember when we used to call doctors and nurses, doctors and nurses, now they're providers. Remember when we used to call patients, patients, now they're consumers. Remember when we used to call medical treatment services? They're now product lines and markets here and so on. So the corporate lexicon has made its way and embedded itself in healthcare. And until we deal with this underlying pathology, treating the signs and symptoms, which is what legislatures are able to do, is not gonna fix the problem. It's like building a house with a solid foundation but it's standing on quicksand. And the people living in the house begin to see cracks in the walls and, and the roof leaks and the electrical circuits stop working and the doors don't close and so on. And they attack those problems one at a time. In the meantime, the whole foundation is sinking. And it's not until they fix the foundation that fixing the signs and symptoms, which in the healthcare system are high cost, inappropriate treatment, inappropriate configuration of services, and really bad results. The United States is at the bottom of the pile when it comes to success in treating uh, medically tra treatable conditions. And we're actually experiencing unique among wealthy countries, a decline in life expectancy in the United States. That's never, that's never happened before. So something is wrong. We're not investing in prevention. Our, our preventive health services are in a shambles. And part of that is because the rising cost of medical care is eating up everybody's budget. So there's a relationship between the focus on profit making, which is very successful, and what's appropriate for doctors and patients. And it's also, I think, the source of another symptom of mal function in the healthcare system, and that is the burnout rate among caregivers. Doctors, primarily primary care doctors, and, and certainly nurses after this pandemic. So we have a system that is too expensive by a large, a big gap. We spend twice as much as the average of other wealthy countries, and we get much poorer results. And I wish there were some simple way to fix this problem because I recognize the difficulties in our political system 
in making big changes. You know, Matt Dunlop, once, uh, who talked to the main all care board when we were getting uh, ready to introduce this resolve, said the most feared four letter word in the state house is change. That's how he phrased it. That's the most feared four letter word in the state house. So I think we need fundamental change. It's probably the most difficult thing to accomplish. You know, if I thought anything short of that would actually fix the problem, I would advocate that, but I don't. After 40 years of experience in this, and just one more thing, the two, two things John didn't mention in my introduction. I worked for five years as a permanent professional staff member of the United States Senate from 1971 to 76, when Ted Kennedy was chairman of the, of the committee in the Senate. And that was the last time before Bernie Sanders ran that we actually had serious consideration of a single payer bill because Medicare was originally intended by its authors to expand to cover everybody eventually. And that's been a uh, goal for years and years. And the, and the reason that Medicare for all idea doesn't die is because it's the only way to solve the problems. And the only way to do that is through public mo mobilization. That's why Maine All Care's focus it's really only focus is public education. We have to educate the public about the necessity for making fundamental transformative changes in our healthcare system. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Terrific. I'm gonna start um, by asking a question and ask each of our panelists to respond if, if you would. Um, I think one of the themes I'm hearing here is that there is um, something obstructing um, the policy uh, in healthcare um, from moving in the direction that the people really need and would benefit from. There's some reason why the democratic process isn't generating um, the policy outcomes that would best serve the public. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? And if so, what are the, and Kate talked about structures, what, what are those structures? Can you put your finger on the structures that are interfering with the, with the process of getting a more democratic healthcare system with a D with a small D? Well, let me take a shot at that. Um, I think a, a big impediment is the way we finance political campaigns and, and the political contributions uh, the healthcare sector is the largest contributor, in, including uh, national defense, including high tech. Healthcare contributes more money to political activities than any other sector of the economy. So that's one. The second one is the checks and balances built into our system. It's much easier in the Congress and in the state legislature to stop something from happening than to make it happen, particularly if it involves significant change. And the third barrier to change, and I actually conducted a panel on this subject a few years ago in Washington, a lot of it is cultural, the American culture, the uh, culture of loving small government, you know, Thomas Paine, government is a necessary evil. The aversion to taxes, taxes, immediately has a negative connotation in legislative bodies. That's cultural. But there's also apathy. A lot of people are happy with their health care right up until the time they have to use it. They think their insurance is great until they try to use it. Then they find out what it doesn't cover. They get into fights with the insurance companies and may go bankrupt because of failure of people who thought they were insured to have adequate insurance. So apathy is one. Second is fear and anger. And I put racism into that category. People are afraid and angry about having to support through taxes, healthcare for people they don't really think deserve it, particularly if they themselves are struggling to pay for their own medical bills. That's a big factor, I think. 
and ignorance is that the, the healthcare system is complicated and people don't understand it. Um, so fear and anger, ignorance and ideology, small government and, and not knowing how the healthcare system works. And then finally greed, the good old American greed. That's, and that is too bad, but you have to understand that's what's built in to capitalism. I mean, if you if greed as an individual is optional, you can decide how greedy you want to be. If you're a CEO running a publicly traded comp investor owned company, that's in your job description. You're required to maximize profitability by many state charters and by the threat of shareholder suits if you don't do that. So they're, it's not they're not doing their job, they are doing their job, but it's just doing it too well. And it's because we let them do it. We're the only wealthy country that allows this to happen. That's where the public education comes in. Jeff or Kate, do you have a reaction to that? It's a very comprehensive response, Phil. I think Phil pretty much covered it. I mean, I think that the we have to understand that these uh, that this system is run by rational capitalist actors, and that is just a systemic truth. Um, and that anytime we challenge capital. Um, we are in for the fight of our lives and it's um, we have to dig deep and we have to be really clear um, that we won't be blinded by ideology or cultural issues or I mean I think that you know the idea of individualism liberation women's rights all of these things end up getting polluted for ideological reasons and we have to just keep following the money and seeing that um, the status quo benefits a certain class of people and it disenfranchises another class. And we just need to be really clear about that and not get misled. Um, yeah. Jeff, you're on mute. Um, I have two just very brief points um, to follow up on a, a very comprehensive overview already. One is you just have to sit in the legislature for a short time, and John has done this too. The, the mind numbing um, testimony of a lot of advocates for insurance, for big corporations, for big business, just it's overwhelming. The difficulty is all those folks are real smart. They're all real well-dressed. They speak perfect English. They all drive a Lexus or Mercedes. And it's, they're a very, very difficult group to uh, counteract. Um, and they sort of play into this distrust of government. And this is a curious American phenomenon that I don't fully understand. And the second thing from my point of view is that a lot of the real costs are hidden. I'm gonna go work for bang, uh, Bath Iron Works and I'm gonna spend all my time in the union trying to get, I'm gonna spend all my time getting better healthcare. Well, that's the major thing. And I'm not gonna be able to therefore spend time on getting better wages, better working conditions and so forth. So a lot of people don't see the effects, the real effects of what um, healthcare costs. Um, let me take another question here, and this is for all, for all of you, but maybe mostly for Jeff and Philip. Um, there's a citizen initiative in the works, um, likely to be on the ballot in 2022 that you've described. Um, is the, um, did the campaign consider the effect of how much money might be spent in that campaign um, when when deciding you know when and how to go forward with the citizen initiative and what exactly to propose was it a factor to consider how much would be spent um, on both sides of a campaign like that a very good question very difficult question this uh, for any resolve or ref uh, referendum you have to have um, proper number of signatures and the 63,000 plus now but means you will have to get 80,000 to work. And that's a fairly straightforward process, requires a lot of volunteers. And I must admit, I hope um, many people, the reason why I'm here talking is I hope many people listening will, uh, will go to the um, website of Maine Oil Care and they will help get volunteers. It's gonna be very important. That's not particularly expensive probably in the realm of 50 or $100,000. On the other hand, then uh, come next January of 22 to the election, 11-22, that's where big money comes in. Um, and 
the answer is you never have enough money uh, for something like this, for TV advertisements, for staff, for volunteers, for paid people. Um, and it's estimated in some of the Colorado experience um, in California, uh, the proponents were outspent by uh, five or six to one. And here in Maine, you can easily anticipate that people are going to be spending five, five, ten million dollars plus uh, against this. Big corporations are threatened by this. Um, so I think that uh, we never have enough money. You you can't plan unless you have a, 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 a fairy godmother. Uh, you can't plan to get enough money. So this is going to have to be a this is a popular uh, referendum. There are a number of big groups that are, I think will back it. Uh, but this is always a struggle. This is the nature of our, we've talked about our capitalistic system. My, I pay my, my um, taxes, they go to Medicare, I have other supplemental insurance, and part of what the money I pay to Omaha, uh, Nebraska, is uh, it's going to their anti-healthcare referendum. I find my healthcare dollars are going to fight against good healthcare for me and you. Well, well, I think you know it's a, it's it's probably one of the most difficult political problems we're facing, primarily because of the of the amount of money involved in the healthcare industry. When I went to work for Ted Kennedy in 1971, which was only five years after Medicare and Medicaid were were implemented, um, we were spending 108 billion dollars on healthcare in this country. Okay, we're now spending 30 times as much. And this is one of the most profitable. If you want to know where all the healthcare dollars are going and why we don't get better results, just look at the market caps of the healthcare companies. They're just going through the roof. And so it's a very efficient wealth transfer mechanism. And that is a, is a big problem. And, uh, you know, George Lakey is a, is a professor who's written a number of books on that, organizing. Kate may recognize his name. But he uh, has written a book called Viking Economics, in which he describes how the Nordic countries in the early part of the 20th century went from oligarchies to democratic socialism. And he said that the only time such large change was possible was in a period of political instability. If the politics are stable, it's hard to shake anything loose. But we're now in a period, I really believe, of political instability in this country, as recent events have demonstrated. And I think there's an opportunity there. And I think that that's what gives me some hope. The other thing that gives me some hope is the young people, the student physicians, the National Nurses United, the women who are active. You know, I hate to say it, fellas, but that's a good thing, the number of women now in legislative bodies, because they understand the value of investing in people, which is something we don't do very well in this country. So this fight is part of a much bigger transition that I think is going on in our society. I think it'll be motivated and driven by young people and particularly young women. And I hope I live long enough to see it happen. <laughs> um, I have another question. Um, setting aside for a moment, the citizen initiative and the uh, the transformational goal that you've described of um, a, you know, a universal health care policy nationally. Um, what are some of the sort of more um, year to year issues that come up in a state um, that are of special interest to stakeholders in the healthcare care um, sector? What are, what are some of the bills and, and, and issues that they might advocate for in Augusta? that would have an effect on, on them and on, on um, patients? Well, I'll, I'll start off if, if you wish. Uh, there's a long list. I haven't come prepared to give you the entire list, but the basic thing in the legislature is incrementalism. 
and things work slowly. Of I can advance a bill, and then it's going to have to um, it's going to go through various hearings of the pros and cons. Those people who are neither for nor against are all going to be heard, and it's it's going to be a balance in the long run. Perhaps that's a good thing for most issues, um, but it certainly doesn't give rise to dramatic change. And some of the issues that are uh, important right now, uh, we've all heard about uh, the cost of medications. Should we be able to buy medications from Canada to import them there? Uh, the main just passed the main legislature uh, four years ago, and then um, it's not was not thought to be legal by the um, National uh, National uh, Pharmaceutical Association, and that's still in abeyance. Um, there are other issues that have to do with um, one that I've been very involved with, prior authorizations. And this gets into the weeds, but it means that I see a patient and I think they need X, they need an X-ray or an MRI scan or whatever, and I then have to uh, have this approved by an insurance company bureaucrat or an algorithm. And so I say, well, um, Mr. Bonigan, you need this particular test. And then we have to go to the insurance company, make sure that they think, and basically um, two thirds of them are say, no, um, you really don't need this, it's too expensive. And it's got to come back and forth. And, and, uh, and in, in the long run, the insurance company usual will um, go along with it. But it takes a lot of doctor time. Um, and so there, there's another very specific thing and there are a, a wide variety of bills that deal with the specifics inching towards uh, solutions, but not really dealing with the, the whole operation. I just have to say as a final thing, I, uh, when I was in practice in Bangor, uh, there were two doctors, two of us, and we had an office of 10 people um, and we saw you know, a fair number of patients every day. And we had one person who put in all of the bill to the insurance company and another person who re-put in all the bills, who, who dealt with all the rejections and the appeals. In other words, that one person, one out of 10, 10% of our, of our workforce was doing nothing but making up for the uh, deficiencies of the billing system. And that, that the problem with incrementalism is that that's the definition of fixing the walls, fixing the leaks in the roof, fixing the, the plumbing and so on, because the foundation is not solid. And it's a game of whack-a-mole. I mean, I, there's a, there are bills in the legislature now about surprise billing, where people go to a, an emergency room and they think they're covered and find out that the doctors who treated them aren't covered what the emergency room is, and they get hit with a $100,000 bill. I mean, that's quite remarkable. And the unconscionable rise in pharmaceutical prices. I mean, we pay two to three to four times as much for the same drugs as people in other countries do. And I was actually at the hearing on pharmaceutical prices a couple of years ago, and there were nine, I have pictures of them, there were nine very well-dressed lobbyists lined up from out of state who'd flown in on their private jets to essentially threaten the legislature saying that if you, if you tinker with our pricing, we're gonna have you in court for the next hundred years. We're gonna have the state in court suing you for the next hundred years. And one of the witnesses was a guy from Canada who had been a, a minister in one of the provinces. And he was sort of chastising the main legislature because one of the bills would allow the importation of drugs from Canada at Canadian prices. And he was chastising the legislature for being cowards by trying to piggyback on the Canadian system, thereby jeopardizing their own system instead of taking on the drug companies directly. Uh -huh. So, let, let me ask another question that kind of ties one, one other thing, just to add, and I try not to give a lot of numbers in something like this, but just the, the three numbers I think are important. One is the, the Euro, European Union averages 10 to 12 percent of their um, GMP on healthcare, 10 to 12 percent. America is 18 percent, and in Maine it's 22 percent. 
So that that gives one real pause. Um, you know, how can we see those numbers, 10 or 12 versus 18 versus 22, and not take action? Sorry, Tom, please go ahead. Can so, I add one yeah, thing to this? Um, so I, I think that we often um, stip, skip several steps to try to come to like the, the answer to the question, how do we begin? Um, and really this begins with having conversations with your neighbors. Um, the main AFL CIO, CIO is doing a really great um, project right now called the Healthcare Listening Project, where uh, members uh, will just simply talk to someone who is not someone that they you know, are involved politically with, maybe a neighbor or family member and just ask the question, how's your healthcare going for you? And let them talk, just listen, listen to them. Um, and, you know, this is how we begin to transform society. There, there needs to be a movement before there can be real political change because we're talking about an extreme power imbalance. And until we build that power from the grassroots on up, we will never really be able to just walk into a state house and say, we're going to try this fancy little, you know, trick and, you know, it's going to pass. Um, so talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends um, and just uh, and listen. Right, it's all organizing is about listening more than it is about trying to foist your opinion on on folks. So, so that that really anticipated the next question I was going to ask, but I'll put it out there for for Jeff and Phil also to respond. But it's like, what is the response to the campaign contributions that Kate talked about, the shiny shoe lobbyists that um, Phil and Jeff referred to? What what is the thing that the individual person on the street can do? Um, to um, you know, try to restore more of a democratic um, control of this sector, this vital sector of our lives and of our economy. Well, they have to, uh, I think they have to, first of all, understand the nature of the problem, and then they have to vote. They have to vote people based on their performance, their willingness to, to uh, actually follow through with their campaign promises. We have one very prominent example of, of uh, one of the congressional delegation has, has changed uh, to recently. But I think that, um, that, that that's, let me give you an example. The, the problem of billing, the complexity, sheer complexity of the system, the healthcare system, according to a study done by the National Academy of Sciences 10 years ago, is between 25 and 30% waste tied to the complexity of the system. Those are dollars spent for nothing other than categorizing people into pigeonholes because of the differences in, in insurance policies and hospitals and so on and so forth. What a Medicare for all system would permit you to do, say for hospitals, I mean, Eastern Maine Medical Center has maybe three or 400 people working in their billing office. And it would allow the, the government to put them on a budget, which is the way most hospitals are funded. And that would not only give us a way to control overall costs, but it would also uh, el eliminate the hospitals having to chase revenue. And it would not have made sense so the, so the main general hospital could have provided diabetic services because that's what the patients needed medically without respect, respect to whether that business line of business was profitable or not. So that's one big advantage and the same yeah. thing applies to the whole system. But that also requires in order to keep the system adequately funded that as much as possible, everybody's in the same system. That's what protects it. That's what protects the educational system in Finland. Everybody's in the same system. Everybody gets the same education and it's well-funded because the powerful people are in it as well as everybody else. Um, uh, with apologies, John, I have just a very brief comment then I have to go. No, I have something else that's nearly one. But just uh, my only response is that um, to quote Churchill, it may be apocryphal, where Churchill says, you can always depend upon the Americans to do the right thing <laughs> after they've tried everything else. And I have to say that I'm still an optimist. I think we can do this. Um, we've done this with gay rights. We've done this with ranked choice voting. And the people really come through. And I think that we, 
I'm absolutely in agreement with Kate. You have to do much more listening than talking. And I think I think we'll get there. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, Apologies and, and bowing out, but this has been very nice. Thank you, Dr. Gratwick. We'll keep going for a few minutes. Um, there's a question from Priscilla Jenkins. Um, Kate, were you um, ready to respond to that one? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question because um, you know most most hospitals are nonprofits, um, and the idea that uh, most people have about nonprofits is that they you know they can just absorb costs and they don't you know have to actually turn a profit. In fact, that's not true. Um, nonprofits, uh, nonprofit hospitals actually work under the same you know. Uh, bottom line as, as for-profit hospitals do, but they do enjoy um, many tax breaks uh, from, from their status. And that exacerbates the problem in many ways um, because they're not, you know, they're not paying for the, for instance, the property taxes of their footprint in a city. Um, that means that they are not, and they may be the, the wealthiest institution in a city, I, certainly Maine Health is that for Portland, um, but they are not paying for street plowing, for garbage collection, the kinds of things that those costs end up getting offset onto middle-class um, property owners. And so we have, um, you know, we're exacerbating that system. And I think, again, this goes back to the education piece of it, which, which is that when you say nonprofit, it just sounds like that that entity is there to serve everyone and to, you know, to basically take a loss all the time. But that is not the reality of the situation. And so I think we need to counter some of that propaganda and educate people about what it really means to be a nonprofit and how that um, is, uh, you know, is exacerbating wealth inequality. Thank you, Kate. We have um, two uh, policy initiatives that are top priorities for the League of Women Voters and Maine Citizens for Clean Elections um, this year. And I'm just going to mention them because I do believe they both tie into this discussion about democratizing such a vital service sector as our healthcare industry. Um, one is our support for the national popular vote which we think is an important measure to reinvigorate democracy nationally and remind people of the importance of one person, one vote, and to um, remind uh, voters wherever they live that their vote matters, even if they're not in a battleground state or in a state that gets a lot of attention uh, uh, historically in presidential elections, that their vote should matter and should count just as much. The second one is our bill proposal to um, ban corporate contributions directly to candidates. Um, now this of course would apply uh, to any industry sector corporation, not just healthcare industry sec sector businesses, um, but it is a measure that we believe will bring a healthful effect across the uh, spectrum of candidates and to some extent political uh, action committees controlled by candidates to insulate them from the pressures of corporate political contributions and to restore you know, the focus on, on the voters, the constituents, and what the people want from their uh, elected representatives. So that corporate contribution ban is our second major priority this year. And I believe it does tie into uh, the conversation that we've had today. So I'm just gonna conclude by saying, um, Kate, uh, Jeff, Philip, we really appreciate having your unique expertise here today. It's been terrific. Um, really insightful, and I look forward to having you back again another time. And um, thank you to all of our um, members and friends and supporters and others who joined us today for this conversation on healthcare and democracy. Thank you.